Most people don't necessarily just want the person across the street that's done the same thing at the same kind of company. They want new ways of thinking. And so then you have to think, well, what even could make sense? Because you also don't want to go too far in the other direction. And then what we call organ rejection, someone shows yeah. up and they're like, wait, what is this? <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, what did I walk into? You know, so you call it organ a- rejection. Yes. I, don't know. I mean, that, that's awesome. Guys, I'm super excited to introduce you to Somer Hackley. Somer and I have known each other for a number of years, and she's someone that I'm excited to have on the Ripple Effect podcast because I want to celebrate her new book, Search in Plain Sight, Demystifying Executive Search. Somer has been in this executive search game for quite a while. She has a list, a laundry list of clients that have really loved working with her. Her firm, Distinguished Search, is really changing the way that people look at career transition. And I think with her book, one of the things that I was most excited to dive in and learn from her today is the fact that this industry has changed and how you go about finding really what work you are passionate about and how to where you want to go invest your time and energy and your effort and to make it in alignment with who you are as an individual to do the kind of work that really, really floats your boat, I think is really critical. And so I know that she's going to give us some great insights there. And obviously, since COVID, the, the the whole transition, the whole change, that way that we go about finding work, the way that we go and look for the possibilities of what a career transition might look for look like for us is really important. So I'm excited to dive in. Plus, she is a really, really great person. She is someone that has a unique energy and enthusiasm. She's passionate about the work she does, but she is definitely a rippler. So I'm so excited to get engaged in this interview and in in this conversation. And with no further ado, let's dive right in. Guys, I am super excited to have Somer join us today for the Ripple Effect podcast. Somer, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you, Steve? I'm great. I'm I'm excited to ripple with you. I mean, we've been trying to put this together for a while, so. I know. No, thank you for the invitation. I love your podcast. I'm so happy. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. It means the world to me. I would, I, sort of said in your intro, like you're somebody that has such enthusiasm for what you do and you you bring a certain energy and I'm just excited for my you know, my folks to hear you and to learn about your book and everything you great that you've got going on today. But one of the things I always like to do to start off with is kind of get an origin story, like a little bit about how you got to where you are, how, how you became this awesome person that you are uh, today. So maybe just give us a little bit of background if you don't mind. Sure. Well, Thank you for that. I feel like our energy will feed off each other. So that is awesome. Uh, So yeah, I grew up in New York and then went to DC and Dallas for a year. And here I am in Austin. And I just absolutely love it. Been here since 2019. And I started my career 22 years ago, which is kind of crazy to think about, (laughs) but uh, it's okay. Um, And I've been recruiting that whole time. I started my own firm a month before COVID. So that was interesting timing. I didn't know the pandemic was going to happen. It's, all is good in the end. Um, but yeah, I started out in contingency, then went to retained and uh, then went to a boutique, still doing retained and here I am. So, uh, and I'd say recruiting mainly like VP plus, you know, okay. a lot of C-level, a lot of VP, sometimes director and mainly tech roles, but a lot of cross industry sort of movement, you know, versus musical chairs, but I've, I've done honestly all kinds of things. So, um, well, so how did you, how did you pick this as a career path? Like, you know, know, I mean, what, what was the inspiration behind wanting to be a part of that sort of that search process? Yes. And there are no uh, majors in recruiting, right? So uh, I majored in economics, actually, of all things. I thought math was fun and probably looked, looked good. It looked like I have a brain when I graduated. Um, (laughs) But uh, I, you know, I went on a ton of internships and then someone told me you should go into sales. And that just blew everyone's mind because I was not, um, definitely wasn't as confident 22 years ago or 25 years, like college is awkward, high school is awkward. And um, I was like, interesting, but I liked the idea of what you put in is what you get out. And I was like, I can do it. And so I interviewed for every single sales job I could find on monster.com back in 2002. And one of those was recruiting and it really just spoke to me. I'm like, that's interesting. We can, I can get behind the people aspect versus yeah. all the other types of sales jobs, interviews I was going on. And then I was just hooked. So that's how I found it ultimately was just the epiphany of sales and then just 
interviewing for every single sales job I could possibly find. I love that. So what motivated the move from, you know, New York to Austin? Yeah. So I went New York, DC, well, I guess New York, Virginia, DC, Austin. And so I met my husband at the time we weren't married, but I met him in Virginia. Then we moved to DC together. And then he just came to me. He went to UT here. Okay. And, um, and he was just like, let's get out of here. I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> He's like, where do you want to go? We made a list. It was Austin or Chicago. Chicago is just very cold. I do yeah. love it though. And uh, he's like, let's go to Austin. I'm like, I'm game, you know, let's do it. And so we just moved and, you know, he ignited his job search. He found a, a position here. And so then, yeah, we just, we just showed up <laughs> and I just coincided the timing of, I I'd honestly been telling work. I'd been wanting to start my own thing for like three years. Yeah. And so with the move to Austin, I'm like, you're right, I'm just doing it. I'm just going to hang my shingle. So, so yeah, well, but it worked out. I love it here. Well, so, so talk to me about that. So like you moved to a new town, you don't really have a network established you and I connected about that first, you know, yes. sort of that first year, year and a half you were in town uh, and, and you start your own thing. So what was that like? I mean, to walk us through that journey a little mm -hmm. bit, because that had to be a little bit spooky, right? Yeah. And I had a six month non-compete. So, and, and I'm like a very, uh, I don't know, like anxious, like I need to sleep well at night person. So yep. I didn't want to not abide by my non-compete. So I yeah. legit had a six month non-compete. And so that was hard because I'm a workaholic. My husband was kind of nervous about like, what is my default state when I'm not just in it, you know, with work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it was fun. <laughs> I'll tell you, it was just, it was just, it, it wasn't like I went insane, but I got the space to think about how I wanted to set things up the right way. And I got to just, you know, just, I don't know, just all the little things that you just never have time to do on a day-to-day -day basis. It was just really nice. But um, yeah, it was, you know, it wasn't that scary. I, I think at the time I had enough confidence to go off on my own. And so, because I did have um, enough clients coming to me with work that I felt, you know, hey, and really my intention of starting my own thing was instead of being the face of 30 positions to fill at a time. I wanted yeah. to do the work. Like that's the interesting about recruiting is the more senior you get, the less recruiting you actually do. And so like, you're just talking about recruiting versus doing recruiting. Like you're talking about the candidates, you're talking to the client, you're making recommendations, but you're not the one finding the candidates networking as much, right? You have right. a whole team under you. And so I'm like, I think I can work on one to three roles at a time instead of 30 and do a better job and love it and have more fun. So I was like, I think I'll be fine. So I didn't actually have all that nervousness because I was doing the same thing just on my own. Um, and I felt a little unleashed, to be honest. I don't know why I didn't do all the things I'm doing now before, but it feels different when it's me and my well, you're an entrepreneur now, so it's yeah. just different, right? You know, it is. And, and you know, kudos to you back in the day because you were like, have you thought about posting on LinkedIn? I'm like, huh. Like up until then, I really just kind of share like comments, you know, but I didn't really just say, here's what I think about this thing, or here's what you, here's what I recommend you do. You know, I've talked to this person in this situation and you actually gave me some ideas for those first posts of like what to even post about. You're like, what, what do you think about starting your firm or what challenges you're facing or why did you do this? I'm like, interesting. I hadn't really thought about that. And then it's just, it kind of just is a flywheel on its own. So that yeah. was fun. And then making my website was fun and thinking of my value prop, like what, what is it? And that was fun. And, and then I started my video series and now, and then I wrote a book cause it was, <laughs> it was COVID a month after starting. And, uh, I had all this momentum, all this, like, Hey, I'm ready. Let's go. I'm open for a business. Boom. <laughs> boom. Like we can't hire now. Like it's a pandemic. Everyone's home. We have no idea what's happening. Like you were correct. I will back off. <laughs> and so, well, did you, did you, yeah. did that make you question it or did it just like recommit you to be like, Hey, we're going to figure it out. It's a, it's a different time. This is going to be a different way that we come out of this thing. Or what were you thinking at the time yeah. that COVID hit? Well, if you remember in the beginning, COVID was more like a delayed airplane situation where they're like, yeah. it's two weeks, you know, yeah. it's yeah. another two weeks. It's, I'm like two weeks, no big deal. Another two weeks, no big deal. And all of a sudden it's like two years. <laughs> But, you know, but in the beginning, if they said this is a two year, you know, at least one year situation, I might have had a different reaction. Yeah, but yeah. Like, two weeks, no big deal. <laughs> you know? So I think because. You survive that. Yeah. It's like a vacation, yeah, I, right? I think because it just kept kicking the can on the seriousness. Um, and then I was just kind of all in. But I, I think I had optimism that it would not last forever and it would be okay. And 
I just caught up with lots of people and like, that's where the book really came from was just chatting with people about how are you? And then I came to realize that people had so many questions about recruiting and how it all works from a job yeah. seeker perspective. And I'm like, I'm just going to write all this down. It's not a big secret, but, but yeah, I don't think, um, I think it's, I just had to pause and rethink how I was going to navigate it. And honestly, all of those catch ups with job seekers helped me have the confidence that it was going to be okay. Yeah. You know, cause they told me that other search firms were on hold, but not everything was on hold and companies were figuring it out. So I kind of stayed plugged in through all that versus just being a hermit and just, you know, crying. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a baby in 2022 and that was all kind of nuts <laughs> with <laughs> just the coming out of the pandemic and just being pregnant during COVID. I was a definite hermit during that time. Yeah. You, you so. definitely don't let the grass grow under your feet. You're, you're obviously, <laughs> hey, let me take on one more challenge, right? Let me, I, know, you know, I know. Launch the yeah. firm and, you know, have a kid. I mean, yeah, good for you though. <laughs> Thank I'll, you. So how have you, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, I think for a lot of the folks that will listen to this podcast, you know, the, there is a lot of questions and we're going to, we're going to jump into the book yeah. here in just a sec, but I really, I, you know, what do you want people to know most about what that recruiting process is, you know, mm -hmm. it, what, what are, what are the, what are the things that you wish people knew more about in terms of the process? I think ultimately that it's, it's a relationship, not a transaction, and it's not about a resume. Yeah. And I view resumes as following people through the process, not the door opener. And even as a recruiter, there's so much that good recruiters do beyond what do you need? Let me go find it here. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a process. It's an emotional journey. There's a lot of mental horsepower that it takes to really understand not only people, but also companies trajectories Yeah, and you're matching journeys. You know, you're matching the companies going through this. I love that person's gone through that. Have they done it more than once? Cause if they have multiple playbooks, that's even better. So they don't just default to the one way they know. Yeah. And it's really like, you really have to sit and think, does it because a lot of this, especially with like I said in the beginning, the cross industry moves, people don't necessarily just want the person across the street that's done the same thing at the same kind of company. They want new ways of thinking. And so then you have to think, well, what even could make sense? Because you also don't want to go too far in the other direction. And then what we call organ rejection. Someone shows yeah. up and they're like, wait, what is this? <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, what did I walk into? You know, so you call it organ a, rejection. Yes. I, I, I mean that that's awesome. <laughs> like there's a balance of of positioning things well and yeah. being honest and overselling and you know and i think there's just a lot of chat online about just how to automate recruiting how to do this or ghosting or just all i'm like this all stems from transactional sure problems you know yeah. or you know just incentives not being aligned but um but yeah i think a lot about this stuff as you can tell hence a book <laughs> but uh, but i but i do believe that um the second people realize that it's not about a resume. It's a whole other thing, you know, yeah. it's, and, and I could go on and on. It, it's like, what is the client doing to set things up internally, politically to make sure that they're ready for this person? How are we getting feedback after each interview? Who's even interviewing the person? You know, how are we just the whole, like, I feel like positions are accepted and candidates make up their mind and hiring managers too in between the interviews. Yeah. You know, there's just so much happening in between all the texts, all the calls, all the emails. It's not just the interview. So anyway, that's, that would be my big takeaway is relationship and journey matching. So, so uh, I love that. I love how you approach it because you're, you really are approaching it from both sides. You're making it a relational experience on both sides of the fence. Right. And that's really mm -hmm. critical to make sure that there's a good match. You don't have that, that organ rejection kind of mm -hmm. situation. Um, but what what is it about companies that you think you know what have you seen or how has it shifted with regards to uh you know especially in the tech sector you know how this has shifted even since covid have you seen a big shift on your end do you mm. do you feel like there's more uh accommodating to that relational process or is it still trying to be a numbers game in a lot of ways it does depend on the client um, but I, but I will say with COVID, the big thing that's changed is video interviewing instead of in-person interviewing, yeah. you know, it used to be aligning, maybe the candidate flies out if it's a relocation, which the more senior you get, the more often that happens. And then we have to align, you know, seven people to meet the candidate. We should get a hotel and the whole thing. Who's going to have lunch with the candidate, you know? And so now 
maybe the candidate flies out at the end before an offer just to make sure it's the right kind of thing and opportunity for them and that, you know, yeah. they have that relationship, but not always. And, and I think what comes with video interviewing is this um, ease of connecting, which also makes things very clunky. You yeah. know, you can be like zoom here, zoom there, zoom here, zoom there. Oh, I can't make the zoom. Oh. And, and if you have a zoom in the middle of the day, how often is your head someplace else? Yeah. And then you show up to a Zoom and you're just like, okay, I have to interview this person. So it's it's hard on clients sometimes too to be there and be present and explain the position correctly and you know, really be attentive. And also I've heard, you know, candidates, I'll get feedback from clients that their eyes are darting all over their screen, like they've got Slack open, they've got, you know, they just can't help it. You yeah. know? And so you, like what if you have a work thing pop up? If you're if you're flying somewhere and you're meeting people in person, like your your phone is in your pocket. Yeah. You know? So yeah. I think it's created this whole casualness but also um i don't want to say laziness but it's too easy to oh let's have them meet another person let's have them meet another person you know so the interviews can go on forever the process can seem disjointed feedback might be harder to get you know so it's it's on us to rein it in you yeah. know and really rein it in in the beginning who's this person meeting why what are they covering how are we getting feedback all that kind of stuff just so that it still feels like a process you know, because it used to be like first round, you meet these people, second round, you meet these people, then we're done. Now it's like, let's meet these 14 people all the time. You know, it's just, it can get out of control very quickly. Well, and like you said, on Zoom, it's really hard to like, you know, did, that 2D experience. I mean, there are certain things you can do to connect with the other person. I mean, we're clearly doing it. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully we're both polished and practiced at it. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, when you pop up and you're like, I have no idea who I'm really meeting with, or I've got just very limited window into who that person is that's going to be interviewing me or I'm interviewing. The the ability to build that rapport in a in a online kind of interaction is really, really challenging. So I'm I'm curious, do you do you have like ideas for, you know, candidates as well as the interviewers in terms of the approach to try and personalize that a little bit so it doesn't feel so disconnected in the process? Is that something you coach? on both sides of the fence, you know, to get over? Yeah, I think that what I see works is the, um, we open up lines of communication between the candidate and the hiring manager before offer. So they can text, yeah. they can call each other, oh. you know, maybe it's not just because that they, they usually have that first interview yeah. and that's very much an interview, but then you still need to want to work for this person. And you want to also make sure that you're the right person for your company. And so I'm like, just text each other, just call each other, just have that rapport so that you yep. can get all your questions answered before an offer comes out. You don't want the offer to come out and then say, oh, I have these 10 questions. Like that's, that means the offer came too early. Yeah. So I'm happy to have people just stay in touch and be in touch, you know, once we start getting down the line and, you know, and I think for, you know, good recruiters will have calls in between interviews with candidates and kind of play that therapist you know yeah. it's it's an emotional decision and so if a candidate's raising concerns or anything it's up to us to raise it at the right time in the right way to not spook anyone but also to get those questions answered so yeah i think we can play a big role as recruiters in easing that you know in that journey well i, th I think that's critical right you know what you just touched on i mean that that is a authentic approach. Um, one of the, one of your clients I know described you as having a real sense of authenticity that you brought to the process and, and that you have this people centered approach to the work that you do, which I think is great. I've heard, and we, you've probably as well heard these horror stories of, you know, the recruiter that basically just drops you into the buckets, like good luck, yeah. sink or swim. And, um, you know, did it work or did it not? And do I need to get another candidate in? And it's that transactional piece that you were talking about. I think that, um, really is challenging for everybody, but, you know, specifically from a recruiter's perspective, you know, you're, you're not, you're not really building the momentum for either you know, the candidate or the client and you're really doing both a disservice. So I love the mm -hmm. fact that you're really so heavily involved and engaged at that. Yeah. Thank you. Now the people aspect is, it's huge. And it's, you know, I think often how do you gain trust yeah. quickly with someone especially if it's just over the phone. Honestly, I like phone more than video. I find yeah. that I can, yeah, like I really do. I, and it's funny because I felt like it was a big secret because it's, everyone's like, oh, video, video, even before COVID, video, video, video. And um, I kind of always like phone. It's not because I don't want to look professional. It's because I can really listen. And I think people can just be authentic and not yeah. 
worry, like when you're on video, you're worried, what do I look like? Where am I looking? All, all these other things are in your head and just taking up headspace or, and you're, or you're thinking about the other person. Oh no. Like, how are they looking? You know, like, what did they react to? Or, you know, when you're on the phone and, and then Adam Grant had a podcast that came out with saying how it's actually easier to assess someone's like true intent and all that just from their voice, just yeah. from their emotion. And so I find that when I just listen and I'm not distracted and I'm not on video, you can really develop trust with people, but you have to not be distracted, you know, and you have to be asking questions that you don't want to hear answers to maybe, right? Like it's, yep. but you're okay with the answer and you're, and you give people an out all the time. You know, if, if this isn't the job for you, that's okay. You know, yeah. maybe there's something else in another year, but you know, but I think just being, open-minded about that, that the end result is what's best for everyone. And like, Hey, like, just, just let me know because there's other candidates who are really interested and it's okay if this isn't the right thing, you know, versus take the job. <laughs> you <know>? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is not good for anybody. No, it's not good for anybody. That's for sure. Well, you know, before we dive into the book, tell me about two distinguished minutes with, um, uh, summer. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the, what you're doing and, and, uh, I, I love that. Right. You know, and, I think the, <laughs> I, I watched several of these. I thought I was subscribed, but I guess I wasn't. So I'm, okay. I fixed that. But I tell me about that. What was the inspiration behind it? Yeah. Well, as you likely know, Simon Sinek has an awesome start with why. And his whole yeah. mantra is, why do we do what we do? And when I was starting my company, I went down the rabbit hole of research. And I ran, landed on his TED Talk. And I'm like, why do I do what I do? And I just thought yeah. about it. And then you have to ask another why and another why, another why to get to the real why. And then I'm like, why don't I just ask people, you know, let them, let me, we, how often do we ask people why they do what they do? We usually ask people what they do, what they're proud of, you know? And so it was nice to take a step back. And also it was um, at the height of COVID. So everyone had a podcast or a webinar or something they were doing. Yeah. And I'm like, I want one. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, yeah. and so I met with two of my, they're not technically advisors, but they're two women that I have gotten to know over the years. They're actually used to be candidates or clients of mine at different points in time. Usually that relationship kind of flips and flops depending where people are at what point. And so um, both of them said to me that the content out there was just so like long form. There's just a lot of it. So it's harder to stand out. And yeah. so why don't I do something short? And so I was like, maybe it's a minute. And they're like, well, maybe two, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so yeah. And then I would just ask people, you know, these are folks I've known for a long time. And I would just email, Hey, I'd, I'd love to have you on my video series. Ask you, why do you do what you do? And it's been really fun. I love it. Yeah. I mean, you do it. You do a great job with it. So let's dive into the book. Um, I, uh, I really love the, I, I love the title, right? And uh, search in plain sight, demystifying executive search. So first of all, how does it feel to be a published author? It's, it's awesome. It's really great. And thank you for the title. I, it, and as you know, you have a book or many books. It's so hard to figure out the title. <laughs> so hard. Everyone has opinions. Ugh, it's, it's so bad. So um, I was just texting with my best friend, actually, like right before it was due. And I'm like, I am like, here are the 50 ideas everyone has given me. I hate them or they're great in different ways. Everyone's telling me like, I had demystifying executive search as the title. Everyone's like, it's a subtitle. It's a subtitle. It's really hard to come. She was like, how about, and she came up with search in plain sight. So yeah. So kudos to give, give her all the things. It's you know, okay. And who's that friend? We should just um, get, we got to get it on video now. <laughs> her name is Erin Patterson. Yeah. She's all right. Way to go, Erin. I'm going to hit you yeah. up for my next book. <laughs> yeah. She's very good at title generation. She, she was just awesome. thinking about recruiting and yeah, no, it was awesome. Um, but yeah, it feels really great. And the crazy thing is I had our son, I gave birth to our son a week after the book was published. So I published the book, thank God it was that order, but I published the book and then, <laughs> and then I went away for three months. <laughs> and so it kind of just sat there. I'm like, I hope people read it. You know, <laughs> I hope someone <laughs> finds this thing. <laughs> so it's been taking off more recently, which has been really fun to see, but it's, um, it's honestly really great to have a resource to give to people because I do feel like there's a void in this whole area of advice of how, like a lot of folks say, like, I've never, I've never looked for a job. I've been here for 15 years. I don't know where to start. I don't know recruiters. Yeah. Whenever they've called me before I've said, go away, I don't need a job. And now what do I do now? I need them. And, you know, people find themselves in these positions where they're either not getting the phone calls 
you can't really apply online, A, because there's too many people applying online, or B, the yeah. roles aren't advertised usually that are retained. And there's also this other subset of people who are about to be VP or about to be C-level and they're interviewing or they want the top job. They want an enterprise, you know, horizontal job. And they're interviewing and always told they're too junior for that job. And they're just like, what am I not saying? So, so the book is really uncovering, like, what are people saying about you behind your back? Who's, who are the people that, that are getting the calls? Who are the people that are getting past the recruiter and to the client? And really how to position, it's not just talking about it, but then it's like yeah. what to do about it. You know, how to position yourself to get the calls, to get past the recruiter, to get through all the client interviews, how to negotiate comp, how does that work? Um, why you're not getting feedback? That's the biggest complaint everybody has is I go on interviews, I don't hear back and it's terrible, yeah. but, in, but at least I explain why it's happening. It's not always that you're a terrible interviewer. <laughs> you know, usually it's not. So, but here are the other 20 reasons. So I just wanted to bring that all to light and I just, I'm just thrilled that, um, it can just help people not only figure out what to do, but also just mentally just give themselves a break. You know, you're not in this alone. These are common things that everyone's saying. So that was really the intention behind it. I love it. You know, one, one of the things that I think I want to make sure our audience like really pays attention to is the opportunity to read the book now before you're actually in the throes yes. of, you know, actually a career change or you're looking at what's next because at that point, then the panic sort of sets in, right? For what I think you're talking about is, hey, look, let's have a game plan going in. Let's figure out some of the things that are important to understand in terms of the process, but also some ways that you can best position yourself when the time comes. Mm -hmm. do, do you feel like, you know, based on your, your work and where you've seen everything sort of uh, really um, migrate and change since COVID, um, being prepared for that next opportunity is really important and, and it is a practice. You've got to be, you know, on your A game to, you know, to be ready when the opportunity presents itself. So that's, that's why your book becomes such an essential tool set for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's really pandemic or not. I mean, this is just for, you know, I've known some candidates for over 10 years, you know, maybe I sent someone on an interview literally seven years ago. And then I call them now for something I'm working on. Because whenever I yeah. kick off a new search, I'm, I first think, who do I know? I don't say, let me go find brand new people to call. I'm first networking with my network. And so the people that I call first are the ones that either I've sent them on interviews before, or if I didn't, they responded to me. They were helpful. They were memorable. They presented themselves in a way where I'm like, I, I, that's, that's someone to know that's someone to know, you know, so the people that are kind of getting those calls, they're the ones that they realize the value of always talking to recruiters, even sure. if you say, I'm not looking, you know, so it's, it, and it can be, it can be 10 years later. It's not just, you know, oh, I took a job, so I don't need to talk to you. It's like, yeah, I yeah. understand that. But, you know, it, it's whenever I, and I find that um, the more junior the role, the more often people don't value that. The C-level people will generally talk to you. Like if you say, Hey, I have this other C-level role. They're like, absolutely. Let's chat. And it'll say, yeah, it's not for me, but you know, I might know someone, but the, the, as you go more junior, they're like recruiter, get out of here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and that's a shame for them. Right. Yeah. Cause, Cause they won't be thought of in a month or in three months or in five years for something else. I always tell the people that I work with, the best thing you can have in your network is a recruiter, right? Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you were looking for a job when you found this one. And just because you're not necessarily open today to change, mm -hmm. circumstances shift rapidly. Um, yes. you, know, you could you could find yourself, you know, sort of unsuspecting, you know, a victim of an unsuspecting layoff, or you could find yourself now working, you know, with a, you know, a new manager that you just don't get along with, or, or you've got a team that's just not the right fit any longer. And I think especially through COVID, I think the, the great opportunity is a lot of people are reevaluating where they are and where they want to mm -hmm. spend their time. And I think, uh, you know, and you mentioned that, like the, that one person that has been at that job for 15 years, you find that people get complacent on a, a number of levels. Not, not only, you know, do I not update my resume with, you know, regularity or have someone like yourself review it so that it's, you know, crisp and sharp and, and relevant to what is happening out there in today's market, but also 
just in terms of the network that often people mm -hmm. people find themselves no longer putting effort towards or building. You and I know a, a company in town that you know goes through a, a ups and downs in terms of the technology play uh, space, um, but people get laid off all the time and then realize, well, my only network was inside this corporate wall. I don't have anybody outside, and so it becomes such a huge challenge for them. And then. Where do you start? I mean, especially in a situation like that, it's like, you know, you're pushing the panic button, and, but there's nobody there to really, you know, answer the call for you because you don't, you haven't done in, enough to build that relationship. Yeah. And my advice of, to the people who are listening and like, shoot, I have not, I've been that person. I have not responded yeah. to recruiters and now I'm looking is it's okay. And the few things are just, I would honestly say, just stop going online and and cold emailing as many people as possible the same exact message because yeah. it's just soul crushing. And so much of job hunting is confidence and positive thinking. And if you don't have that optimism and confidence, like it just comes through. And sure. so I would say just just maybe do 20% of the time. Like, oh, I looked at job ads, 20%, no more, no more. <laughs> don't spend every day, wake up, let me go online. Same ads, oh no. You know, so what I would what I would tell people to do or advise people to do is Start with your network, as you talk a lot about, and it's the ripple effect, right? It's people know people know people, and your network knows recruiters. Who placed them in that role? Like, call someone who's in the job you want. Who placed them in that role? Or what interviews did they go on through what recruiters? Can they introduce you to those recruiters who sent them? Because there's so many recruiters out there. It's not just the brand name firms. Yeah. And yeah. so finding recruiters that are in your space through your ex-colleagues is a great way because then you get referred in you know that they're working on positions that interest you you know they're a good person and at least igniting your search that way and then you're catching up with people you know and i'd say the second point to that is be ready for those calls and re remember the matching journeys yeah and it's all about journeys so knowing where you add value to the next place is is critical versus let me tell you the 50 things i've done since you know since 22 years ago when I graduated college, you know, it's really based on everything I've done. Here are the three things I'm really good at and just summing that up. So when someone opens a role, they're like, I know who can do that. I know exactly who can do that. This person, they said they do this. They bring companies from there to there or they do this and that. And so it's just sticking those like it's it's kind of your product pitch, right? For yourself. Yeah. Um, not your entire career history. I think that's where people fall in that trap of let me shove everything in I've ever done into this 30 minute conversation. But then are you memorable? Will anyone think yeah. of you for anything? So um, I love that. I love that perspective. I think one of the things that you said there though, is uh, that I think is a good reminder for people. You know, when, when I connect with a recruiter and I, I've built that rapport and that relationship, maybe there's not a fit today maybe not tomorrow either. Right. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, also coming back to your recruiter to have something to ask them about and mm -hmm. Hey, what are the roles are you trying to fill? Maybe I know mm -hmm. somebody in my network. One, it keeps you fresh uh, in terms of your other connections and in terms mm -hmm. of actively trying to say, Hey, what are, what's important to my, you know, my, my big contacts out there. But then if you can create that sense of yes. commerce, right. For the recruiter and, and a friend or a colleague, um, you've really done something significant. And I have to assume that the recruiter is going to think kindly of you every single time, right? That there, there's yeah. an opportunity that's a good fit for you. hundred percent. Yeah. I, I talk a lot in the book about being a giver and, and I quote a lot of Adam Grant in my book and just approach it. And people also feel that being a taker feels, ugh. You know, when you're yeah. emailing someone, hey, I'm still looking. Hey, do you have anything? Yeah. Hey, how how's it going? Anything new on your desk? It just feels, ugh. but if you're like, hey, I'd love to chat with you about what you're working on. Maybe I know someone, right? You're, yeah. you're approaching it as a giver. Hey, I'd love to tell you what I'm seeing in the market and the trends I've been seeing this quarter. You know, and, and I, I, there's a gentleman in the book, Bill, who took this to a whole other level when he was looking for a role. And what he did was he had an Excel spreadsheet he kept, he asked every recruiter the same seven questions. He wrote down answers and then he told all the other recruiters what other recruiters were saying. And it was so awesome. He was, you know, yeah. he told me like, Hey, I talked to these recruiters and they said this about the market. This is the types of roles that they're seeing picking up. And this, I'm like, I want to talk to Bill. Yeah. Bill knows what's happening. Like, and he's telling me really cool things that I can't just find online. I don't know what's going on, you know? So it was so awesome. Like stand out. Right. So being a giver, like, 
creating your own knowledge base that you can provide, you know, job seekers, you know, all kinds of things. And it just feels great. So yes, a hundred percent. There's so many things that rather than, will you review my resume? It's yeah. just different. It's a different conversation. Yeah. I, you know, I, I see that a lot of people I work with and coach, you know, through career transition, there is just this natural hesitancy, you know, to, to really do it. And it's often the times, you know, often it's the people that have not spent the time or taken the effort to actually build their larger network either. But you start looking, you know, I had, <clears throat> I have someone that I'm actually related to that actually found themselves in a career transition unexpectedly. And I said, well, how many times, you know, you tell me all the time you're recruited to all these companies. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but I don't want to go hat in hand to that. It's like, well, that's, they reached out to you initially, right? There was some interest. You said no, but doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't try and re-engage. They thought enough of you to make the call in the first yes. place, right? Mm -hmm. And it was actually a, one of those reach outs to the person that they were. I know it's an ego thing, right? It's It, it becomes down to being, you know, very either insecure about how to approach it or, well, I shouldn't have to do this. People should find me. And he had finally reached an age. It's actually like my brother reached an age and sort of that level of income that unfortunately, even though we're not supposed to do that, discrimination really is a real thing and it mm -hmm. happens. Right. And, and so he was in a, in a, in a place where he had always been recruited out of an organization into the next better deal. And all of a sudden those calls kind of dried up and then the opportunities dried up. And then the company he was with had a massive layoff that he never saw coming. And then all of a sudden, you know, he's like, you know, why, well, you know, why would I do that? It's like, well, do you like eating? I mean, <laughs> if you want to, if you want to get to that next level, you're going to have to, you know, you have to go back and reestablish those mm -hmm. connections and, and you maybe eat a little crow. Yeah. I kind of blew you off the last time you called me. I apologize for that. I really was busy or I, totally. you know, Headed to a conference or whatever, I should have spent you know a little bit more time. But you have time now. Hundred percent, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And it's it's true; those things happen. And yeah, I think just owning it versus pretending, yeah, you didn't respond to recruiters in the past. Just say, hey, yeah, like you just said, I should have written you back, or I should have at least taken the call. And here we are. You know, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and and if they're good fine. recruiters, they're going to understand, right? Because yeah. it's it's a numbers game for them as well, right? So 100%. at the end of the day, it's like probably no harm, no foul, unless you were a total jerk. And I could actually see that being <laughs> the case in this situation. <laughs> but yes. he doesn't listen to my podcast and we could talk about him. But, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> um, you, you always want to be respectful and mindful, even if you don't have a need and in, in, in an interest right now. You It doesn't mean that won't be the case, you know, three months, six months, two years from now. Yep. Yeah, hundred percent. So, as far as your book, right? What, what, what would you like uh, our audience to know about it to go pick it up today? I mean, like, what you know, what are a couple of things that you know really stand out in terms of? Don't give away any of the secret sauce, but at the end of the day, you know, a couple of things that you know that you know you're hearing from folks that have read it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and been able to apply it in terms of uh, their search or, or even from a company's perspective, right? Why mm -hmm. they need to know it because they need to know this end of the business and how to engage with someone like yourself to really benefit themselves for, you know, finding the right people for six months, a year from now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd say the biggest thing I, I changed about the book was I first wrote it very fast and horribly, and then I wrote it again. And what I did the second time was I incorporated a ton of research and a ton of interviews. So it's not just me, like I'm doing right now, soapboxing about what I think about things. It's it the, the table of content, the citations at the end are so long because there are so many quotes from experts. And these are like the Adam Grants of the world, but also I interviewed my counterparts, the internal recruiters. We had to go through corporate communications to get approval for chapters. Oh, wow. I interviewed lots of COOs and CTOs and CIOs and CEOs and all these people, both on the job seeker side and the hiring manager side. So it, it took me forever to, to figure out how to put it all <laughs> together in a streamlined fashion that made sense. But that's what people, I think, can take away. It's not just my opinion. There's a lot in there of here's how Amanda you know, now who, you know, you brought up ageism, you know, she said, especially as a woman, you know, how she combats that. And what does she do to her LinkedIn profile? How does she negotiate compensation on interviews? And now she's getting calls for seven figure roles all the time. And That's it's just awesome. her advice or, you know, women of color and, and compensation or, you know, just what internal recruiters are expecting from external recruiters or, you know, how, I think a lot of it too in the um, 
I spend a few chapters in the beginning talking about the dynamics between recruiters and clients, because I feel it's so easy to just flip ahead and say, how do I prepare for this interview? Yeah. But, but having that fundamental knowledge going in of just how it all works can help you have the right mindset and position the conversation in the right way. And I think it's, it's not something people talk about, like how do recruiters even get the clients they have? And, you know, I have a lot of also, I know people learn through stories. So every time I have a lesson in the book, I, I, would, I was like sitting down, sometimes on airplanes, sometimes on vacation, I was just sitting with my head in my hands, like, what's an analogy for this? So either I found I one it. online, like I'm quoting friends, I'm quoting SNL, or I just made something <laughs> up from my head of like, say you're at the doctor, or say you're a realtor, or say that, you know, so there's analogies and stories throughout the whole thing, just so that it's um, funny and memorable. But, um, but I do think that understanding the pitch process, you know, how recruiters win the work and how those dynamics set up at that moment in the pitch to win the work can affect whether or not you as a candidate even go ahead or if yeah. you're getting feedback or all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's people don't always think, oh, well, maybe the recruiter three months ago promised the client some crazy thing to get the work, you know, and that's why I can't even interview. Like, cause you could yeah. be like sitting there, I am perfect for this role. But what if the recruiter said, I will only send you people from fang companies. Yeah. There's nothing you can do, you know? So I'm trying to shed a light on all of that behind the scenes so that it's other people's expertise. And also you're just like, Oh, okay. Now I get it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And it's not just like, what am I, what else can I do? Sometimes it's just move on, you know, like sometimes there are things you can do, um, but sometimes it's just move on. And well, you know, yeah, like right you way. said, I mean, sort of in your, your subtitle, it's demystifying the executive search. And, and there is a reason you have to demystify it because it is mm -hmm. a confusing, sometimes, you know, often secretive process, you know, if yes. you're, or maybe not so secretive, you're just not asking the right questions or you exactly. don't have the insight going in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just equipping people with that so that they can, ask better questions to navigate the whole the whole pr process better. You know, I don't think candidates ask me, how many candidates have you sent to this position? Do you have anyone scheduled for final interviews? What has the feedback been on the candidates you've already sent in? You know, when you interviewed me, what could I have done better with you? You know, and so you could ask me, all, I will give you all these answers. You know, that, those and, are four money questions right, right? there. <laughs> you know, and just knowing, just have you had an offer turned down? Have you yeah. like, how long have you been working on this position and why is it taking so long? Or am I the first one in or am I the 20th one in, you know, or usually uh, it's not 20, let's say seventh, you know, but, uh, and that's the other thing to know is usually recruiters are sending like five to 10 candidates max in, you know, so are you one of those? And it's, yeah. So all these questions you can, can help you understand how fast the process is going to go, you know, when you're going to get feedback, how many rounds there will be and how you can position yourself better than everyone else has all this kind of stuff. Right. So the book has, that's why it's 300 pages. <laughs> There's so much in there. Well, you had me with SNL story. So I mean, yes. you know, <laughs> I have a whole Stuart Smalley quote. It's just, because it's like mindset and confidence. And I, I love it. Yeah, uh, all kinds uh, well, of stuff. knowing you as I do, I mean, I love the fact you, you, and I think people will see this, whether, whether they're watching the video or they're listening to this on the audio platforms. I mean, your energy and your enthusiasm for what you do, it's infectious. And I can see why a companies want to work with you and bring you in to help them find the right candidates. But ultimately also why the right candidates want to end up working with you because you have just this, you know, I can see why on the phone it would be like, you know, cause you like, I, I could listen to this all day long. I mean, you're just so <laughs> calming. I'm like, okay, I'm not looking for a job, but maybe I should be. And maybe <laughs> well, you know, thank you. At, at the end of the day, it's a talent and it's a skill and you're obviously doing the work that you were destined to do. So kudos to you and congratulations on the book without question. Thank you. We, I do we'll have the audio book. I was going to say, if anyone wants to listen to me for seven hours and 30 minutes, it's I think that, now I, on I would, yeah, I would encourage that. I think that would be, I think it would be great. <laughs> I, it was a, I, I know if you went through the process I did to record my book in audio form, it was a lot of fun because you could actually expand upon it a little bit. You can add some personality and the, the written words, the written word, right? But you know, the audio platform gives you a lot of flexibility to kind of do that. So I, I think people could easily listen to you for seven plus hours. No problem. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs>
I, I, I'm just saying, I'm just, I'm telling you, 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 you've got a skill. So at this point of the, um, our show, what I always like to do is like shift into ripple mode for a little bit and actually ask you some ripple specific questions. No, no gotcha questions, but really questions are kind of fun to ask, fun to answer and give people just a little sense of you as an individual, if you're cool with it. Yeah, go for it. All right. So what did the seven-year-old version of Summer want to be when she grew up? I think I wrote this in my, like, I, ha I have all these old journals in here. I think circus clown. I think probably because I was going to the circus a lot at that point. Circus clown. Okay. <laughs> As a kid, my dad would take us to Barnum & Bailey in the city. So I think I did write that down for a moment. And then I went through all my other, you know, but you're a kid. You don't really know what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so seven, sure. I'm going to go with that. I love that. That's a good one. <laughs> If you were doing what you're doing now, which is being a kick-ass entrepreneur, what would you be doing? Mm. I think I'd probably be a teacher, huh. probably. Um, yeah, I because I remember when I was in college, I was asking people about teaching. And just sales, I just, I love, I am a very uh, carrot and stick person with commission. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that drew me in, but I That's love. Great. Yeah, it's definitely teaching. no carrot and stick, at least on that end for a yeah. teacher, right? <laughs> yeah, I, but I love it. I love math. I love teaching. I used to, when I babysat, I used to always, you know, teach the the little one math through the library. And, and I was majoring in economics at the time. So her mom was like, this is amazing. If you can teach her a long division, <laughs> that'd be great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. That's awesome. And you being, you know, carrot and sticks, like, well, hey, look, you know, you know uh, pay me a little more an hour. <laughs> I know, right? Exactly. That's all, so, oh, that's funny. Yeah. So what would you consider your superpower? Aside from your math skills, which sounds like. They're <laughs> no, awesome. they're gone. That was so long ago. <laughs> um, now we have Google. <laughs> um, I would say the ability to disarm people and connect with people pretty quickly. And um my husband has that too, honestly, and and I noticed that about him immediately. But people just tell me all kinds of things, and they'll say like, "I don't know why I'm telling you this." And like, so I, I just think I have this. Uh, I feel funny like talking about myself that way, but like I just feel like I have this extreme empathy for everyone and whatever situation they're going through, and the ability to ask a question and really listen to the answer and try to get to the bottom of of what's going on. And I've been through a lot, and I feel like. There is some value in um, having depth in what I do, you know, in terms of like life and, you know, because candidates are going through stuff, whether or not you take a job is, it's not just about the money or the job. It's yeah. about family. It's about whatever situation you're going through right now. And a lot of people either, you know, and now I'm a mom too, so I can add that in, you know, so I do, I can talk about my son all the time and all the things that come with that. But yeah, I do think there's, um, there's something there where people just tell me stuff and I love it, you know, and, and you have to be careful with that. Right. Cause you can, um, if you were a bad person, you can use yeah. that to your advantage, but yep. you know, I, I really care about the long-term success of everybody. And I think people see that. That's what makes you a good rippler. I think really at the end of the day, I mean, you are definitely that you're somebody that's committed to whoever's in front of them. If you can add value and contribute to them in some capacity, I think uh, that really shines through for a lot of people. It definitely does for me, for sure. Um, who inspired you to be the person you are today? Mm. I'd have to say my husband. He's the best. He's just the That's best. That's good. What's yeah. your husband's name? Yeah. We'll Steve. give him a shout out as well. Yes, Steve. Yeah. Steve? He's oh, awesome. great name. Yes. I know. I was going to say, it's the same as your name. <laughs> um, yeah, he's, he's just, uh, I met him through a, whenever, not whenever, like twice, the two times I've moved to a new city, I started up a meetup called table for six. This was, oh. I would have kept it up, but then COVID it's basically how you get COVID is eating <laughs> with strangers in a confined space. You know? <laughs> so I was like, this sucks. <laughs> but, um, but maybe I, did anybody actually check you to make sure that you didn't start COVID? <laughs> <I know. laughs> it's like let's meet, let's eat with people we don't know and inside and you know, small space. Um, no, <laughs> I, mean, I don't I think you told me about this. This is yeah, cool. I, okay. I could have had it in Austin because we were such an outdoor space vibe yeah. to Austin, but I do think that having a reservation 
and being forced to sit down and eat with five strangers is awesome. And, and, and it was like, this group grew to 900 people in DC. Like it's wow. interesting how many people want friends and, and, and the problem with being, <laughs> I was, <laughs> there was no group for me, meaning like I wasn't trying to find a date. I wasn't into any particular sport. I didn't, yeah. I didn't have a thing. I was like, I just want to make friends. Like I, you know, and so I said, if you're single, if you're married, I don't care what age you are, anything, just That's awesome. here, this is, it's dinner. You know, people would email me this or meet up, message me like, Hey, can you segment the tables by age? I'm like, no, there are so many like twenties only or whatever's only like yeah, yeah. do that, you know, go do yeah. that. Like, this is not, this is, you might eat with someone who's 65. You might eat with someone who's 20. It doesn't matter. And so it was funny because Steve came to the first one I hosted in, um, in Virginia and I, he's so friendly and like the kind of person that always makes sure that, and I like tables of six because it's easy to have one conversation. Once it yeah. gets to eight, people start branching off, you know, and they still do that with six, but you can rein them back in. Yeah, um, yeah. But since that's why I like six versus the long tables. And so I noticed that Steve would always make sure to include the non talkers and Love just, that. you know, and just keep it. And that was just his natural state. And that's mine too. And so I would never sit with him. I know. And I set up the seating chart in advance. So I would never have him at my table because it was like a waste of us being together. <laughs> And so, and I finally told him that after we were married, I was just like, I never had you at my table because we're both so good at including everybody. And I need someone, like, I need to designate people. I'd have like five tables of six at the same time at a restaurant. And so I'm like, I need to, to scatter the good people yeah. around to make sure that everyone's having a good time. So anyway, but, um, but yeah, I would say just, he embodies that. And That's so awesome. just that kind of empathy and being a giver and just, you know, loving life and all of that is, makes me a better person to who I am. That's great. I love that answer. That's fantastic. Plus he's got a great name. Let's just be honest. He does. (laughs) And our last initial is H also. So yeah. Oh no. Yeah. yeah, That, that, uh, that would be true. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's fantastic. What's the best thing about being an entrepreneur? I can, like I said in the beginning, I feel unleashed. It's just like, I can just do things that, and just kind of test things out. I could have done that before, but it just felt different. So, you know, now I'm like two distinguished minutes. Sure. Podcast, sure. Book, sure. You know, meanwhile, I'm still recruiting. Right. But it's just so much fun to kind of do this other stuff. And now I'm launching an online course to go with the book because people keep asking me, for advice or career coaching and this, and I, it's not what I do. You know, it's right, not, right. I, I, I work for companies to fill roles, but I'm like, at the same time, I think I could scale that into something. Yeah. And so maybe have monthly office hours or have an online video series to go with the book or something like that. So like, I don't think I'd be doing these things if I worked at a firm. It's just been kind yeah. of fun to just try things out, see what sticks. And, and I think the most fun thing is to, I try it out with my network. You know, yeah. I'm always asking for feedback. I'm saying, what do you think of my website? What do you think of this? What do you think of that? Or even like I said, with the two distinguished minutes, like how the idea came to be was from my network. It was just asking people what I should do. And so that's been really fun. It's not just me sitting in a corner thinking up ideas. I'm like inspired by everyone I'm talking to all the time. I love that. Well, you know, one of the things that we did, and I'll, I'll definitely, we, we can talk offline about this, but we created an online community called The Pond. And one of the things mm. that we're doing in there is we've got a career ripple. So love to, we're definitely going to cool. feature this this episode when it goes live, but we'd love to have you come and even maybe present at some point on, on the to. course, because I think uh, all of our ripplers would really benefit from that. And yeah, and you know this as as well as anybody, right? You know, we create it as an opportunity to try and create connection between employers and um, those that are maybe thinking about or are in the midst of a career transition. Mm-hmm. And it's such a lonely, isolating, you know, experience, right? So trying to create an opportunity, much like your dinners, right? Try mm-hmm. to get people to talk and engage, because mm-hmm. you never know where that might lead and what kind of opportunities might um, all of a sudden be obvious and present themselves. And so I think that uh, we'd love to have you engaged in that in some capacity. So we'll talk about that for sure. Perfect. What, um, two final questions. What does the ripple effect mean to you when you hear that term? Yeah. I mean, I just, I truly feel that magic happens when people talk to each other and you never know. Like I, I think a lot about people's fan clubs and it's, I think there's so often people chase they try to create a new fan club, you know, like trying to meet new people, which is fine. But for me, the ripple effect is you have a fan club, like you're, people are cheering you on 
and you may not even know they are. Like they might be someone you talked to 10 years ago. They might be someone who's just following you online or like they're just, they just want you to win because you made yeah. an impact maybe once. And if you connect with them or catch up with them, who knows what doors would open from that conversation. Absolutely. And, and that's what I found with start, starting my own firm is, you know, it was very tempting in the beginning. What I did was I'm, I'm in Austin. I should try to get into all these Austin companies. And I was, I, I had to stop it. And I was like, you know what? I have a fan club. I just have to go remind myself of that and find them. And then yeah. the second I started catching up with people I already knew, doors opened. And, if, you know, maybe I shouldn't ignore Austin <laughs> and I don't want to. I, I'm thrilled I'm starting to, now that, you know, I'm getting invited to speak at things. I'm thrilled to start creating my Austin network. But I, I really haven't done that as much as I should have been. I mean, book, baby, COVID, all the things. But also, like, I just haven't been. <laughs> but, a few things uh, going know, on. Yeah. All the things. <laughs> yeah. But, um. But yeah, I, I do think that just people lead to people lead to people. And it's it's unexpected sometimes who is cheering us on until we actually go around and, and reignite some of those relationships. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah, and, and what a great definition for sure. Well, last question is, what ripple can I create for you? Oh, well, thank you for that. Well, you talked about your community, so that would be cool. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, clearly, if if anyone, if you know anyone who's ever looking to hire an executive, you know, that's the world I'm in. Mainly, okay. I'd say technology, product, digital, data, security, operations, like that world. Um, but also, yeah, if you know anyone who's excellent, who's looking, keeping their eyes open, um, happy to chat. And uh, yeah, and thanks for sharing, you know, talking about the book today. I think that that alone is a ripple in itself. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm a big fan. I actually do have somebody I will refer you to um, very soon. I think it could be a good fit for your services. And what's the best way for people to connect with you, you know, follow you? What, how do you want people to, you know, engage with you? Yeah, I'm, I'm a recruiter. So I love LinkedIn. That is <laughs> that is I was going to say, yeah, that yes. would probably be number so, one, right? Yeah. So I'd say find me on LinkedIn. I, I'm an inbox zero, in mail zero kind of person. I will, I do read and respond to everything. Um, but yeah, connecting on LinkedIn, I think is really great because then we see each other's activity. We stay on top of mind with each other. Yep. Um, emails tend to be great because they don't get lost, but also I get so much email. So I, yeah. I do like connecting on LinkedIn. I think it's a nice way to, to stay in touch with people. Absolutely. Well, we'll, we'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile in the show notes for sure. And then the book is on Amazon. Yep. Can they get it through your website as well? Or is it just, you know, exclusively through there, Barnes and Nobles, where, where, where would you like to send people to get the book? Yeah. On my website, it's just a link to Amazon. So okay. yeah, I'd say Amazon Audible now. I'm so excited about Audible. Um, yeah, awesome. Yeah, I know. It's, it's like a weekend, so yeah, I'm excited. Oh, it's but, a, oh, it's that new. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, the um, the recording was due February 15th. They're like, you cannot kick the can on this any longer. It's been two years. <laughs> <laughs> like, I have a baby, so I'm sick now. I'm sick a week a month because he's in school. You know, it used yeah, to be every yeah. other week, and so the yeah. first three chapters, you won't know this, but I was so sick. <laughs> Oh. And I'm like hacking and dying. And so they, they like got like all my tea swirling and coughs out of the first three chapters. And then I got, cause they were like, this is due February 15th. Like they had a fine on me if they I did gotta not. get it going. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, but I, I have a, I have a toddler and I'm like, we're always, you know, kids bring home all the things. And oh so yeah. It's hard to find like a three week stretch where I'm not coughing. It's very hard. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it's now on audible. <laughs> That's awesome. I just finished. Just got it done. So, well, yeah. you'll, 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 you'll be immune by the time you do the second book. So I know. Right? No, no, I'm done. One book. <laughs> One book. It's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, it is a lot of work. But well, congratulations on everything you got going on. I am so excited for what you're doing today, where the future lies for you. I mean, it's, it's great. I think everybody that has tuned in today will absolutely benefit from just what you do and how you do it. And just a little bit of pulling the curtain back and helping us really truly demystify the process. And I encourage everybody to go out and get your book. I encourage people to, you know, to link, you know, connect with you on LinkedIn and, you know, just continue to learn from you. I can't wait to learn about the course and see what we can do to support that as well. Cause I think that sounds like a fantastic idea. Thank you. And likewise, thank you for having me on. I'm just grateful to be a part of this and one of your 
distinguished guests on your side. So thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Well, I appreciate that so much. Guys, we will be back again with another episode of the Ripple Effect podcast. But until then, ripple on. <laughs>